Cicero's political thought is grounded in his ideas about the nature of the Republican Constitution. The way that Cicero thinks about constitutional law is influenced by the Greek tradition of constitutional thought that runs all the way back through Aristotle even beyond. Cicero thinks that there are three kinds of constitutions, rule by the one, rule by the few, and rule by the many. He thinks that there are correct and deviant forms of each of those three, as we've seen in many different contexts. Cicero also develops the ancient strand of thinking about mixed constitutions, that these different types can be mixed even within an individual regime. And Cicero outlines in detail how he thinks this constitutional theory is institutionalized in the Roman Republic. Cicero, in his book on the Republic, recounts the constitutional history of Rome from its very beginnings, the foundation of the city, through the monarchical period. And Cicero, in fact, says that even during the monarchical period of its history, Rome already had a sort of mixed constitution, that there were already elements of rule by the one, obviously in the form of the kingship, rule by the few, in the form of the senate, which the Romans believe go back to the very first days of the city itself, and rule by the many, that there are the institutions that allow the public itself to have a voice. But what Cicero thinks the mixed constitution lacked in the very first days of Rome, in the monarchical period, was balanced. Cicero's main contribution to the history of constitutional thought is to advance on ideas of the mixed constitution towards an idea of a balanced constitution. Cicero sees the establishment of the Republic, the overthrow of the monarchy in 509, in which the Romans established a system of rule by two consuls who were elected for annual terms and shared power, as a great advance towards balance. But he actually sees that the Republic continues to progress, and so he describes the institution of the Twelve Tables of Roman law, the first written form of law, as a great advance towards a balanced, mixed constitution. And Cicero sees a certain period in the early Republic as the ideal period of the Roman Republican Constitution. In fact, Cicero thinks that the Republic of his own day has been thrown out of balance, because Cicero thinks that the ideal Constitution will have a balance between monarchical, aristocratic, and democratic elements. And Cicero, in fact, thinks that the state will be best, that the Republic will be in its ideal form, if the aristocratic element is in power. Now Cicero thinks that there ought to be monarchical and that there ought to be democratic elements and that these ought to be balanced with the aristocratic element, but he ultimately sides with the aristocracy in the belief that this is where the best wisdom, the best guide for the state will lie. And what's interesting about Cicero's account is that he develops strands of this kind of thinking that are present in Aristotle, who also thinks that aristocracy, which in the case of Aristotle's political thought, we said should be considered truly a meritocracy, ruled by the best, the most virtuous, which is what aristocracy really means. Cicero pulls this out, but advances on it and contextualizes it in the background of the Roman political system of his day. Now what's different about this is that the Roman aristocratic element is the Senate, and Cicero believes that these are truly the best. But when we think about Cicero's aristocratic element, we're truly beginning to talk about a real aristocracy. An aristocracy partly of birth, but most importantly of wealth, because the Senate in Cicero's day is dominated by men of great wealth. And so Cicero's constitution is a mixed and balanced constitution that's weighted towards the aristocracy, but very much an aristocracy that is dominated by the wealthy elements of society. And for Cicero, this is the ideal state of the Constitution. But already during his lifetime, the Constitution has been thrown out of balance towards democracy. And in fact, Cicero is a critic of excess democracy. He believes that there is such a thing as too much democratic liberty, that if the people have too much say, that it in fact inherently destabilizes the Republic. And so Cicero is a critic of democratic elements within the Constitution. He sees them in his own day and age as being excessive, as being too powerful. He believes that the people are fickle, that they're not necessarily wise, and in particular, certain kinds of elements. In Cicero's political thought, we see a very strong idealization of the farmer. We see in Cicero's political thought a certain kind of idealization of the small farmer. 
This will become fundamental to the ideology of republicanism throughout the rest of its history. And as we'll see, it's very strong in later periods, including the early American Republic, when people like Thomas Jefferson were strong advocates of a kind of republicanism that was centered on the ideal of a citizen farmer. People like Cicero believe that farmers make good citizens, that they have a kind of independence, that they don't depend on others for their wages, for their pay, that the kind of lifestyle that's required by agriculture cultivates in the individual a kind of responsibility, a kind of outlook and attitude that makes someone a good citizen. And so Cicero sees this as a kind of ideal for the ordinary man, but he's certainly skeptical about urban masses and certain kinds of elements of society that depend for their pay upon wages uh, and that aren't independent small farmers. And so there's a kind of image of society that's inherent in Cicero's constitutional outlook. And Cicero's constitutional thought is important in two other respects. One is his attitude towards property and its relationship to the origins of the state itself. Cicero in a way synthesizes two different strands of political thought that had existed since the days of Plato and Aristotle. One is the idea that somehow the state is a convention, a compact that people create to maximize their utility or well-being, and the other is that the state is natural. Cicero tries to break down this dualism and to say that the state is in fact natural insofar as people are naturally social creatures. Just like Aristotle says man is a political animal, Cicero believes that humans are naturally sociable, that they want to live in societies. And Cicero at the same time believes that the purpose of the state is fundamentally tied to the protection of property. Cicero is a great defender of the rights of private property. And in this sense, he's conditioned by his place in the Roman aristocracy as someone who's wealthy, has enormous land holdings and commercial interests. Cicero, when he thinks of property, lives in a very different kind of society than say Aristotle had, which is still a relatively traditional agricultural society. The society that Cicero inhabits is a commercialized society. In fact, Rome in the first century BC is probably already by that time the wealthiest, the most prosperous, the most commercialized society that the world had ever seen. And so when Cicero thinks of property, he's thinking more fundamentally of all kinds of property, landed and commercial. And he's a great defender of private property and believes that the purpose of the state is to protect property rights in individuals, that this is the, one of the most fundamental purposes of law, is to provide an orderly system of property rights and transactions. And so Cicero, as a political and constitutional thinker, cuts through this old dualism between property and convention on the one hand and natural sociability on the other, to see human society as an outgrowth of our natural instincts, but also a way of devising a set of rules that protect private property interests. Cicero's thinking about constitutions and politics is original and important in a second way. Cicero synthesizes the Stoic idea that people have a common humanity and a kind of common dignity. But at the same time, he also believes that there is a wide spectrum of human difference. Now we've seen, for instance, going back through Aristotle's political thought, that people have different levels of value, that not everybody is equal. Not all people are equally meritorious. Some people are better than others. Cicero develops a way of thinking about this kind of problem. He says that people have two different personae, that there's one kind of common human persona in which every individual, simply by virtue of their being a human being, is entitled to a certain amount of dignity, a certain kind of respect, that all people are moral, rational creatures who deserve a certain kind of political respect simply on those grounds. At the same time, people have their individual personae, that they have their own developed individual embedded social personae, that they are who they are as an individual, and that on this account, individuals are of different worth, that some people are better than others. And it's a very powerful way of thinking about common humanity and individual difference. Cicero says that people have an inherent moral dignity as human beings, but that they have different levels of dignity, of dignitas, simply by virtue of who and what they are based on their merits. And in fact, Cicero believes that because people are unequal, they deserve different kinds of rights and privileges. And Cicero's 
constitutional system imagines that the Roman aristocrats represent the better part of society, that they represent those who are more worthy, that they're of higher value, of higher dignity. And because of that, they deserve greater power. They deserve greater rights and privileges within the Roman Republican Constitution. And so Cicero's political thought, in which the Roman Senate should be supreme, should have a kind of authority that is foremost within the system of a balanced constitution, imagines that this is based upon merit, that some people are better than others. Now, whether that's the case or not, we might highly doubt. But nevertheless, there's at least a, a rationalization, a way of explaining this that resonates deeply in terms of the philosophical tradition.